Aaron White, thank you so much for joining us today, or me today, as, as the case no may worries. be. Uh, appreciate you taking your Monday afternoon out. Um, I've been doing a series on community and, you know, I see a lot of your posts on Twitter, you know, so it was a, a really easy approach, like questions that you're asking people, like, sure, you know, what are you, how are you engaging and, and whatnot? So I had a couple questions for you today. Really wanted to get your viewpoint on this. I understand that you interact a lot with Clubhouse, for example, and doing a lot of these kind of consulting um, engagements, right? So I figured we start out pretty simple. How do you see community? What's your definition of community? And in that grand scheme of things, how do you see community, whether it be physical or digital community, how do you see it changing, especially in, in this year? Sure. Community is a group of people. Um, often these people are aligned towards the same direction. Sometimes they're not. They may have something, an affinity. And right now, today's modern community in 2024, because we're all segmented and sequestered in different locations, uh, usually is in the form of an online community. If not, the physical one is just your very local neighborhood or school or workplace. So the definition of community has certainly changed because of COVID-19. And um, there, we're definitely seeking community. It's a core part of who we are. We're tribal, we're, we're primates. We want to be part of a pack. We want acceptance. We want relevance. We want to be accepted. We want to be seen. We want to know we're safe. We want to be with other people. So community is part of this the, the condition and it's a survival instinct. But yet at the same time, in the era of, of this pandemic, it could also be our undoing because physical community in close proximity is causing sickness. So it is a complicated question that you asked. So thank you. But in the end, it's about us. So given the changes, given that proximity can lead to, well, in, in certain cases, sickness can yeah. uh, impair our ability to communicate. How, how do you view organizations ability to change? Like when you go and consult with an organization or you're trying to provide right. information to them, how are you instructing them to look after community? Yeah, well, community is is people. So if you care about your customers, or you care about your employees, or you care about your partners, you care about your investors, then you inherently care about community. So the argument is so uh, easy to make. Uh, but when it comes to asking for budgets, executives don't really understand how does that manifest. So I mean, community doesn't need to be just with the community manager. It doesn't need to be with the head of customer care or customer experience. It could be with account managers. It could be with partner managers. So the, the difference is now that um, more than ever, people need to get truthful information. One of the woes that we see in society, Dave, right now is called the infodemic, where we have too much information or the wrong information or the information is late or we have incomplete information. And so our trust is being reduced. As a result, people are seeking information from uh, companies or experts or even from other their peers within a community. And, and this is more critical than ever. Of course, it has its own, it's wrought with its own problems. So uh, the point being here is that uh, organizations need to foster and enable community because the human condition is seeking and yearning it, especially during 2020 when we are all uh, distributed. You mentioned a real key word in there and something I'm actually embarking on a course of study on for my doctorate is in, in the concept of community and Ooh. trust. Yes. Uh, you know what? You're never too old to learn, right? You're never too old things, to kind right? of <laughs> exactly. You, you've got to have that. I mean, if you don't have the trust, then you basically have a factions fighting. Exactly. So how do you look at, how do you instruct an organization to build trust? How do you give them rubrics or metrics for engendering trust with their communities, whether they be new, you know, something that's nascent, mm -hmm. something that they're just starting out to do, especially in a, you know, gig economy, you know, type, type environment, right. or some of these like, uh, we'll call them legacy, I'll call, I would say IBM's a legacy company, but you know, mm -hmm. something that's more uh, established already that has maybe a user group that's already kind of there, and they're looking to push and enlarge their, their space. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of phases or steps, I mean, or criteria, if you will. The first one, having a purpose and making sure it's aligned towards an organization. Now, if we're talking about a corporation or maybe a university, the, the purpose is towards that particular product set or towards the learning of the individual. So being clear on the purpose of the organization and how the community aligns to that. The second one is um, making sure that um, you, you empower the voices to be heard and 
and at certain times it means this is a delicate balance and why you need seasoned community professionals and moderators is to lift up the voices and, and acknowledge that they're heard. But at the same time, you have to know when, when do you maneuver or push or squash or, or remove voices that are causing harm to the community. And that in itself is such a delicate thing. So, and that helps to em, embolden that trust and foster trust that you know it's a safe place for those individuals to talk. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody says the same thing at all times and is all in agreement, but the conversation when there's disagreement is on the topic, not attacking individual to individual, which you see so much of in online communities and social networks today. So I, I think those are the two most critical things in 2020 is having a purpose and a, a vision of the community that aligns to the organization and two, uplifting voices but at the same time, diminishing voices that are hurting the group. And I realize that's a controversial statement to say. Oh, absolutely controversial. So let's go down that path just for a little bit. Sure. Then. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you see the balance of negative voices, right? There's, there's the natu you know, nature of community is to be homeostatic, right? Is to kind of maintain that delicate balance between mm -hmm. not too much excitement, but not too much negativity. So where do you find those bounds? How do you... Sure. How do you figure out what's too toxic, if you will, or maybe on the opposite mm -hmm. end, too excitable that's dragging the community in a different direction than it needs to be going? So I look for intent. So if somebody's trying to rile up the community with negative content in order to hurt somebody or to, um, to cause harm to others intentionally, or is putting out fake information to cause that second effect that you just mentioned to rile up the community, then you have to look for intent. That person is not in the spirit of the community. Uh, but if the person is giving questions or just has a different perspective, then you need to enable that and make sure that the conversations happen at the ideologue level, at the ideal level, and, and try to remove the ad hominem aspects. And that's where a skilled community manager, much more skilled than I am, can really come in and lead that conversation and enable for that to happen. Uh, but having those parameters and going back to the first phase, like if it's aligned towards a goal, like towards education or towards a lifestyle of a product or service, then there may, you can use that as that that, that arming point where the conversation doesn't necessarily fit. Uh, I realize that it gets very contentious when, when the world is talking about inequality, which stems all the way up down education and, and corporations as well. So this is a very delicate time in 2020. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Do you feel that organizations have, you know, whether they be technical, you know, a technological organization like the company I work for or, you, or not, do you feel like there is room for them to maybe have a separate community? We call them sometimes employee resource groups or communities of interest, right? Around some of these socially divisive topics. Their agitation to an end, right? We have representation from people groups, races, colors, creeds, genders, yeah. sexual orientations, or whatever. Sure. Do you feel that that's a that's an appropriate use of resource? I know that's a. I don't want to put you on the spot too much that's, there because I'm that's happy a to very take all these question. topics on. No, it's that's fine. So internally, yes, I'm aware that those groups happen. But if those groups are not heard and action, it doesn't happen. Then it's it's futile. Futile. Uh, and so I have spoken to numerous people in marginalized communities in employee work groups and they feel like sometimes they're just being shoved to the corners to have those conversations but the executive team doesn't actually take action unless people from the dominant group say hey we're not actually making any changes we've all put up those those logos and in instagram in support of a marginalized community but we actually didn't do anything so it's just lip service so that's the risk there now on the on the public sector if you're running i'm sorry on the public space if you're running a in a, a community for your customer base, uh, I think it depends how it's set up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't enable those conversations to happen there, then of course, they'll happen on the unfettered internet. So that's just the, the natural order of, of things. Um, so it's hard for me to give a blanket statement completely on this because it really depends on the situation and scenario out there. That these are complex issues that are all being thrust upon community leaders this specifically this year more than ever. Yeah, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon, right? Especially with all the it's, return to it's work. Going and, to, yeah, it's going to accelerate. So the fact you're bringing these questions up right now, Dave, is very timely. Well, thank you. I can 
blame the universe, I suppose, to a certain extent for what's going on. <laughs> so last but not least, I know time is short here. How do you view yourself as part of the larger community? What, 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 when Jeremiah wakes up in the morning, what does he see? What does he view his role and responsibility as outside of being an employee or an owner, right? What do you, what do, you do? What, what drives you in, in this community? Mm. I don't have some grandiose, grandiose role in which to participate. Uh, I, you know, I don't have a specific title that is really relevant. I mean, my official title is tech analyst where I'm, you know, tracking the trends and how society and business is changing using these connective and connected technologies. Um, but, you know, I do want to help support the voices of those leading the charge, the community managers. Um, 11 years ago, I, you know, founded the Community Manager um, Advancement Day, which is still being recognized in different groups to really celebrate those on the front line that are trying to help m make a rigid organization be open and porous so the, the, the relationships and the trust could permeate through from employee to customers, which in the past was completely locked away. And, and so I, I want to be able to support those individuals who are trying to make those changes. So I see myself as kind of a, a supportive role. That's that's brilliant. I like that. Um, all right. Last but not least, word yeah. of wisdom. If you could say one thing to an audience, and given my audience is rather small, it doesn't matter. This will go out somewhere. What would be one word of advice you'd have to somebody that's looking to join a community or you know has a hot button issue that they want to participate in? What's what's top of mind for you yeah and and this is beyond just online communities but the uh, and i'm and i'm personally struggling with this too um it's just to have some empathy this is a really tough time uh and and uh, you know sometimes i feel stressed out because i'm managing kids at home while trying to do a business um or, or you know my business you know is going up and down because the market's going up and down it's very stressful and there's people that are not like me like might be in another part of the world or in the, my own country in the in the united states where we don't have a lot in common but to have the empathy means to understand what it's like from their perspective or from a customer's perspective or from somebody who doesn't share the same uh, worldview as i do what is their perspective and then find the commonalities. That's what the empathy is. Where do we align and sit? And so a good community leader is going to have to do that, not just from her perspective, but from the, the people in her community that might be opposed to each other. What is their viewpoint? What is their viewpoint? And bridge that. Where are the commonalities? I mean, this is a really key thing as the world itself is becoming divided to have that empathetic skill set. So I think that's something that we all need to work on. And I'll be the first to raise my hand. I need more help on that. Oh, me too. Me. Absolutely. Well, Jeremiah, thank you for your time today. I think we ended right where we needed to end. So thank I you appreciate your insights me. and uh, you know, looking forward to having you on here again at some point. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thanks.